Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. I am Dr. Amrit welcoming you to the Diabetic Retinopathy series. In this video, we are studying the classifications of diabetic retinopathy. The classifications which are used uh, in the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy is widely used internationally and it laid the foundation for classification of the diabetic retinopathy. And it was actually classified based upon the standard photographs which were described in the EDTRS or the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study. So remembering the study is very important. So basically diabetic retinopathy is divided in this way. We have uh, first of all no abnormality in which diabetic retinopathy is absent. Then we have mild NPDR, moderate NPDR, severe NPDR and PDR. So basically based upon the presence or absence of new vascularization, diabetic retinopathy is basically of two types. NPDR in which NPDR stands for non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and PDR which stands for proliferative diabetic retinopathy in which we have neovascularization. The NPDR can further be classified into mild, moderate and severe based upon the different features and then we have PDR which is again of low risk and high risk variety. So let us see each of them one by one. What is meant by mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy? In non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we will never have neovascularization. Okay, and in mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the clinical finding that we see is only the presence of microaneurysm. So, if you can see in this picture, the entire fundus essentially looks normal. However, there's only one small uh, circular spots which are present in the fundus, and these are indicative of microaneurysm. And this patient, if he has history of diabetic mellitus, this is a case of mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or mild NPDR. Coming to what is meant by moderate NPDR. The moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy is said to be having more than microaneurysm but less than the severe NPDR. That means we will have microaneurysms but along with those microaneurysms you can have either the dot blot hemorrhages or you can have presence of hard exudates or cotton wool spots but there will be no signs of severe diabetic retinopathy. So for moderate NPDR you can remember microaneurysms along with the dot blot hemorrhages or along with cotton wool spots or along with the hard exudates okay i hope that's clear now look at this picture over here so we have we actually have microandrisms and we have hard exudates we have certain uh, in smaller parts we have some dot blot hemorrhages also so this indicates dot blot uh, this indicates moderate uh, NPDR. Similarly, over here you can see certain microaneurysms here and then you can see the hard exudates which are present in the macular edema and you can see certain exudates which are away also from the macula. This is again moderate NPDR and since the exudates are also present in the foveal area, this could also be a moderate NPDR along with diabetic macular edema. So just remember that it is not as severe as the severe NPDR. And it is not as mild as the mild NPDR in which we have only microaneurysms. It is somewhere in between in which we have along with microaneurysm certain findings like hard exudates or cotton, or cotton wool spots or we can have the uh, dot blot hemorrhages. So what is meant by the severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy? In order to remember severe NPDR, you have to remember number one and understand what is meant by 4 to 1 rule of severe NPDR? The 4 to 1 rule stands for presence of intraretinal hemorrhages and microaneurysms in more in about four quadrants okay and when i say four quadrants that means if i divide the retina into four quadrants like this the intraretinal hemorrhages and usually it is said more than 20 intraretinal hemorrhages should be actually present in all the quadrants and like this hemorrhages should be actually spread out all across the retina in all the four quadrants so that is the first four of the four to one rule second thing is the presence of venous bleeding in two quadrants now, in my video on clinical features of diabetic retinopathy, I explained to you what is meant by venous beading. So, if you see this venous beadings in at least two quadrants, okay, it could be more than two quadrants, but if you see it in at least two quadrants, it is the number two 
uh, second rule of the 4 to 1. And what is this 1 quadrant? If you see presence of Irmas in 1 quadrant, that is the number 1 of the a 4 to 1 rule, right? So 4 to 1 stands for presence of interretinal hemorrhages in all the four quadrants, venous bleeding in at least two quadrants, and Irmas in at least one quadrant. Now, if any of these three, three, uh, these three is present, any one of these three is present, the person is said to have severe NPDR. So what I mean to say is, if there's a person who has diabetic mellitus and he comes to you and you see the there are hemorrhages all across the retina, that means the patient is having severe NPDR. PTR. Or if the patient comes to you and he has a, if you see there are two quadrants of venous beading that makes it a severe NPDR. Or if you see a patient he has only Irmas in one quadrant, again it makes it a severe NPDR. So any one is also sufficient to classify it uh, to the category of severe NPDR. Now, why is it important? Because the patients who are suffering with the severe NPDR, they have about 15% chance of progression to the high-risk PDR in about one year. Okay, so the risk is 15% chance of progression to high-risk PDR. Now, what is meant by this very severe NPDR? So, as I told you about the 4 to 1 rules, that is the hemorrhages, venous bleeding, and IRMA in 4 quadrants, 2 quadrants, and 1 quadrant. And in severe NPDR, if you remember, only one criteria was enough. If the patient, however, has any two of the four to one present, that means he might be having hemorrhages also in four quadrant and he might be having venous bleeding also in two quadrants, right? Or he might be having venous bleeding and irma together in two and one quadrant respectively. Then if any of the two danger characteristics of the four to one rule is present, then the person is said to have very severe NPDR. And in very severe NPDR, the chance of progression to high risk PDR, you can see, has increased increase to about 45 percent so just have a look at these fundus pictures okay so you can see the hemorrhages almost entire four quadrants you can see multiple hemorrhages are present and you can see venous beading in about two quadrants and this is definitely a high risk uh, it is a definitely a severe uh, NPDR because there's no uh, new vascularization over here it is NPDR and since you are seeing venous bleeding in two quadrants and hemorrhages in all the four quadrant it is a severe NPDR now just look at this picture over here you can see again the uh, hemorrhages which are present in almost all the full qu four quadrants here you can see the small small micro aneurysms are also present and there are hemorrhages also which are present and uh, uh, so this will again make it a case of severe uh, NPDR. Coming to the proliferative diabetic retinopathy which is called the PDR. Now in PDR one or both of the following will be present. So what are those uh, characteristics? The first is the presence of neovascularization and third is the manifestation of neovascularization that is vitreous or preretinal hemorrhage, right? So about 50% of the patient who are having very severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, they will progress to PDR within about one year. So as I told you, this is just a uh, rough estimate because the patients with a severe NPDR, 15% chances there and uh, those which are having very severe, 45% chances there. So on average, about half of the uh, half, that is about 50%, they have a risk of progressing to the proliferative diabetic retinopathy within about one year time frame. So uh, what is exactly the certain important features of the PDR that is proliferative diabetic retinopathy? The proliferative diabetic retinopathy is actually characterized by neovascularization. And as I told you on my video on IRMA versus neovascularization, these are nothing but new vessels which are coming from the retina and optic disc and they will proliferate superficially along the retinal surface and into the vitreous with or without a fibrous component. Okay, so usually uh, the new vascularization will occur when more than one fourth of the retina is actually non perfused. Okay, so almost one fourth of the retinal area should be ischemic to develop new vascularization. And mainly it is the retinal hypoxia which will actually manifest as capillary closure and capillary dropout areas which will lead to non perfusion and ischemia. And finally, we have this cascade in which new vascularization will occur that will cause the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Now, new vascularization can happen actually at different different locations based on which it is actually labeled. 
So we can have this new vascularization present on the disc, which is called the NVD, in which the new vessels are present on the disc or within one disc diameter of the optic nerve head. Or we can have the new vascularization elsewhere, NVE, in which the new vascularization is in the retina away from the one disc diameter from the disc. And the new vessels can also come on the iris, which is called rubiosis iridis, which carry a very high risk, of course, of progressing to new vascular glaucoma. Now, there are certain complications which occur with new vascularization, whether it is on the disc or within the uh, other than the disc, which is called new vascularization elsewhere. Number one is that uh, because of the NVE, the vessels which are NV, uh, new, new vessels, they lack the barrier properties. That's why the fluorescent will actually very rapidly and intensively leak from them and that is how you differentiate them from IRMA. Moreover, they are very fragile and they tend to bleed very easily into the vitreous and causing obscuration of the media because of the vitreous hemorrhage or preretinal hemorrhage. Along with that, the new uh, vessels, they are associated with fibrosis and gliosis and membrane formation. And because of that fibrosis, that can lead to tractional retinal detachment. So what happens is as these vessels are growing on the surface of retina, they will get uh, replaced by the fibrotic material and any fibrotic material has a tendency to contract. And as this fibrous membranes will contract, they'll also pull the retina along with it and causing it to detach from the RPE and because this detachment is occurring secondary to the traction which is caused by the fibrous form membrane formation of the new vascularization, this is called TRD or tractional retinal detachment. So what is meant by this high risk uh, PDR? The high risk PDR classification was given by the diabetic retinopathy study also called the DRS study. Okay, the high risk PDR basically means uh, three characteristics. There are three definitions for high risk uh, PDR. So either the patient has new vascularization which is associated with vitreous hemorrhage. That means if a person is having new vascularization of the disc and I already told you what is meant by NVD. NVD means if new vascularization is present on the disc or within one disc diameter of the disc. Okay, so if you draw a, uh, another circle which is made up of multiple uh, disc surrounding that of one disc diameter. If any new vascularization is present on in that area or on the disc that is called NVD. So if you have just a new vascularization present and along with that you have vitreous hemorrhage then it is called high risk PDR. Okay so that is the first criteria. Second criteria is when the new vascularization of the disc is more than one fourth of the disc area, that means if you divide this disc into four parts and you have new vascularization present in one quadrant, okay, and more, sorry, more than this one quadrant, that is more than one fourth, okay, then the vitreous or preretinal hemorrhage present uh, is present or not, it does not matter. Okay, just mere presence of new vascularization of the disc, which is more than one fourth of the area of the disc, is sufficient to classify the patient as high risk PDR. Then we have the new vascularization elsewhere. New vascularization of the elsewhere, whose area is about more than half of the disc, the disc area, along with the vitreous hemorrhage or preretinal hemorrhage, is again classified as the high risk PDR. So, if you want to remember what are the features of high risk PDR, remember that number one is the presence of new vascularization, which is more than one fourth of the disc area. Number one. Number two is any new vascularization of the disc along with the vitreous hemorrhage and third is new vascularization elsewhere which is more than half the area of the disc along with vitreous hemorrhage. So for new vascularization elsewhere always you need vitreous hemorrhage to be present. For a simple new vascularization of the disc you need vitreous hemorrhage to be present. However if the new vascularization of the disc itself is so big that means more than one fourth of the uh, entire area of the disc then you don't need vitreous hemorrhage and preretinal hemorrhage for the classifying the patient to the high risk PDR group. So I hope that is clear. So just have a look at this picture. You can see so many tufts of vessels and just look at this disc. Okay, there is NVD no doubt and you can see almost uh, half of the disc is involved with this NVD. So this is like definitely more than one fourth of the disc area 
and since it's more than one for this and uh, disk area you don't need to now search for vitreous hemorrhage and stuff like that so definitely this is a high risk pdr case similarly over here also you can see there is all this uh disk uh, new vascularization of the disk present at the same time there's also nve which is present so when you have nvd and nve both present always use the nvd for classifying the patient for the high risk pdr so you can see it is more than half again so definitely this is a case of a high risk pdr however if you consider nve alone this is almost about one disc diameter which is more than half so it fits a, a classification but there is no vitreous hemorrhage in this case and there's no preretinal hemorrhage so if you consider only the nve it will not fit into the high risk uh, pdr category but whenever nve and nvd both are present we have to consider the nvd and since nvd is present and it is more than one fourth of the disc diameter or disc area then definitely this is classifying and falling into the high risk pdr so i hope that is clear to you now look at this picture here the nve is at the nvd actually is not much it's very small and you can however see over here this boat shape hemorrhage the preretinal hemorrhage so just the presence of nvd along with the boat shape hemorrhage preretinal hemorrhage will definitely definitely classify this patient uh, as the high risk pdr okay similarly here you can see some blot hemorrhages here actually the patient is having vitreous hemorrhage which is obscuring our view so probably this is also a case of pdr along with vitreous hemorrhage now we do not know whether it is high risk or not because we do not have a view of the new vessels elsewhere or on the disc so what is the term high risk pdr basically means so what is the risk and what is this high risk that we are talking about so it means that the patients with high risk pdr the patients with this level of neovascularization actually have a very high risk of severe vision loss and what is meant by the severe vision loss in diabetic retinopathy study the severe vision loss or svl actually means when the snellens equity falls below 5 by 200 okay and why was this level of vision uh, loss chosen as the benchmark because at or below 5 uh, by 200 the patients actually lose their ambulation also visually guided ambulation also will become very problematic in these patients who are suffering with the so much severe vision loss and such patients have a very high risk of losing their vision and losing this uh, this visual equity and that is the reason it is called high risk pdr now finally uh, one more uh, classification is there that specific to diabetic macular edema diabetic macular edema uh, till now what we have discussed is the classification of the diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema can actually fit in any stage of diabetic retinopathy so the diabetic macular edema can occur with moderate npdr okay it can occur with severe npdr it can occur with very severe npdr it can occur with pdr or high risk pdr so diabetic macular edema is an entity which can actually fit in any stage of diabetic retinopathy